This is an 80s Mint special with me, Daz, and our very special guest, Richard Drummy from Gore West. Since 1982, Richard has been making music with Peter Cox, and together they've created an impressive portfolio of albums and singles and awards. Uh, their first album, self-titled Gore West, was released in 1985 and included hits such as We Close Our Eyes, Call Me. The album went on to achieve platinum sales in the UK and gold in the US. Go West's subsequent albums included Dancing on the Couch, Indian Summer and Ten. They've also received numerous awards and nominations including a Brit Award for Best Newcomer in 86 and ASCAP Awards for The King of Wishful Thinking and Faithful. Please welcome to the show Richard Drummy from Go West. Yay! How you doing, Darren? Yeah, really good, thank you. So, so pleased to have you on the show. We find you in the middle of a tour with Go West across the country. You must still get a huge buzz from playing to audiences these days. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I, I actually prefer it now to, to when we first started because right. it was all a bit daunting. I mean, uh, I'd, only, I'd only really played in school bands and stuff and the... the uh, the biggest audience I played to was 300 and then we we ended up doing Radio 1 in concert straight up to do the tube and then flying to Japan to play to 30,000 people in Yokohama Baseball Stadium so I was a bit of a nervous wreck especially since we had the best musicians in the country and I'm I'm not one of them so um, yeah but these days I'm very at home on stage as people anyone who's told you will will attest because I because I, I rab it on <laughs> when we should be playing songs anyway. And we've spoken to a lot of uh, stand-up comedians recently on the show, and, and they, they see a, di- a, a, a real difference between audiences around the country. Now, you, you've toured the world many times, around the UK. How do you find audiences differ on your travels? This is a sweeping statement, um, but basically the further north you go um, in, in, in Britain, um, the audiences are you know more nuts and we, we played a gig re- we played a gig recently well not nuts but i mean that you know more responsive yeah. they'll get into it more i think the thing with london is you know there's a there's there's just everyone's really really sport for choice or it might just be people in london but uh, we did a gig recently in ireland where it absolutely tanked down i mean people must have been wet through to the skin and of course we're on the stage with a cover over it yeah. and they went they they were just so amazing and that was uh i forget was it kim i can't no i'm not going to say it and get it wrong but it was it was in ireland recently i think it was a rewind show and they were fantastic as far as the rest of the world goes um yeah, Australia, you know, obviously they're very outgoing and, and America too. Um, I suppose the most unique audience is, is Japan, yeah. um, where they tend to be quite respectful. It's almost like, you know, it's a very, um, oh, what's the right word? You know, I mean, you can't, you can't. There was one day where we, they had us doing 13 or 14 interviews. And after about the 13th, I said, I can't do it anymore. And they were like, no, no. You have to do. You have to do it. And I'm like, well, yeah. and then somebody said to me later, "You can't do that over here, Rich. You know, if you yeah. say you're going to do something, do otherwise, it. you know, yeah. So, uh, but they're they're great. They, they're really good audiences and always fanatical in in, in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. So. This is 80s Mint with Daz and our Go West special. Joining us is our very special guest, Richard Drummy. Richard, we've chatted a little bit about the, the your tours, uh, performing live. How did the whole thing get started? You and Peter first get together. Um, well, I said I'd, the biggest audience I'd played to was 300 people, and that was at a place called The Winning Post in Twickenham. And right. um, our guitarist at the time, this wasn't Go West, this was, I think we were called Rigor Mortis or something like that, or Free Agent, and various <laughs> names we had. And um, we'd, done a, we, we'd done a gig that got reviewed in the local paper, and uh, Peter phoned me and said, because uh, that was back in the day when you had your name in the phone book, and... Yeah. Um, he said, oh, could I come and see you play? And I said, well, that's very nice of you, mate. I said, yeah, it won't be for six months, though. 
Um, I said, but we are rehearsing. I said, if you want to come and have a look. And he was actually, he told me later that his intention was to see if our drummer was better than than their drummer right. and then he would try to poach our drummer um and he sat and watched this for I don't know, half an hour or whatever and then he said okay well i've got i got to shoot off now and i said um okay well well thanks for coming down and it was actually sliding doors moments probably the wrong wrong things it make adds a bit of romance but he'd actually got out of the door and i i couldn't see you know he and he disappeared and i and i shouted me me and, and he, t he came back in. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, I, I haven't asked you about what you do. And I, I, I said, you haven't got a tape of, of your band with you, have you? which we all did. Yeah. And he gave it to me. I took it home and um, I listened to it. And, I, you know, I thought his band was brilliant, especially his voice. Mm. And so I called him back and said, when can I come and see you play? You know, yeah. and then it, it kind of went from there. Um, uh, yeah, we were friends for... We did really start writing together for about, I don't know, seven, eight, and maybe even nine years later. Uh, and uh, yeah, then it took us a long time to get a deal. We got mm. a publishing deal first in 1982 right. uh, with uh, ATV Music. Um, that was quite a good com a fun company to be signed, signed with. We said, who else have you got on the label? And they said, uh, oh, there's only three of you. I went, oh, really? He said, yeah, it's... Uh, you, a heart, and the Beatles. And I said, oh, okay, <laughs> fine. So when That's Michael, when Michael, when Michael Jackson bought, finally bought the Beatles mm. catalog or bought ATV, um, we got, I, or I got a telegram from Michael Jackson saying, you know, it's really great to have you on board, you know, uh, wow. which was nice actually. I shouldn't take the Mickey because he, he, he actually, you know, yeah. didn't just sort of go, yeah, well, you, you just come with the package, mate, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That, that's amazing um and, yeah. and and what what was the defining moment richard when you knew that you'd made it was there a defining um, moment well there were there were there were a few i mean there, there was getting the publishing deal was great because yeah. then i i gave up i gave up you know my day job uh then the next one was when we got signed to chrysalis which was you know uh i really thought that that the, the, you know we were on the publishing with the publishing company for three years and every year when the contract came up i thought that's it now mm. better go f phone my own my old job and see if they'll take <laughs> me back um but then a guy called ron fair came over from the states it's a long story i just say he signed us in the end yeah um and then i suppose the next one was um driving over q bridge and bruno brooks playing we closed our eyes and we actually pulled the car over and we just were speechless we were like we're on radio wow. one that's, that's ridiculous how's that happened yeah. and uh yeah, uh, I suppose the last one would have been when um, we won the the Brit, um, yeah. which the category that we won for best newcomer, uh, it was called then, uh, was voted for by uh, the general public, not by the you know the yeah. the Brit panel. So uh, yeah, there's a few of them. There's, there's loads more, but I'll leave <laughs> yeah. it at that. Now you've known Peter for a very long time. You've worked with him, toured with him. How have you managed to stay mates when, when so many other bands fall out after that amount of time? We haven't. I can't stand you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> moving on. No, I'm, a, I'm, a, no, I'm it's an exclusive. Uh, no, it was. It was. We're we're very different. But Peter, I know if Peter were, were talking to you, he'd say that that him, he and I are very different people. Um, yeah, well, I've known Peter since I was sixteen, which is yeah. you know, which is a, a little while ago now, and. Um, We've always been the same, you know. Writing has always been a bit of a headbutt, uh, headbutting exercise. Peter and I writing because we both do everything. We can both, you know, Pete can write a whole song on his own. I can write a whole song on Maya. We're not, we're not like Chris and Glenn from Squeeze, who, yeah. who uh, pretty much, you know, ninety nine percent Glenn will, Glenn will do the music and and uh, Chris will do the words. But uh, yeah, we're fine. I mean, when we did the Indian Summer album in Los Angeles. We made the mistake, and I didn't want to do it, but which I think hurt Pete a little bit. But they put us in the same house, and I thought this isn't going to be good. Mm. And indeed, it wasn't because you go to go to work, and then things come up at work. It's a bit like working with your missus. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And then you get home, and you you know you carry on the disagreement you had <laughs> earlier on. Yeah. And that was that was after that album. I mean, we basically put out King of Wishful and Faithful, um, and they did very well. And I think Pete just saw that as an opportunity to to leave and i think we just had enough of being in the gang i mean we'd known each other 
trying to work out how long it would be but we, we'd known each other for at least 25 years by then yeah. and uh as i say it worked out all right for me because i i i firmly believe if we'd have gone on uh, at that point i probably wouldn't have ended up having my kids because you'd be too busy yeah, yeah. you know but it, as, as it was i came back to england and i the lady that I was with in in, uh, in the States came over and, uh, yeah, the rest is history. This is 80s Mint with me, Daz, on our Go West special. Um, I'm here with Richard Drummy. What we're going to do, Richard, is we're going to have a game of the Go West jukebox. Uh, you pick a number from 1 to 10. Whatever song comes up, we'll have a little bit of info about it from you, uh, and then we'll play that song. Any number from 1 to 10, Richard? Oh, the hard ones first, eh? Um, I'll go for 8. Eight. Mm, faithful. Can you tell us a little bit about right. Faithful? Um, well, Faithful was um, on the Indian Summer album. It was. Um, it came out in America after the King of Wishful Thinking. Um, so we wrote it over there um, in in the states, and it did very well. I know King of Wishful got in the top ten, and I think Faithful was like twelve or something like that. And we won a couple of awards for that. In fact, one of them says that it was in my, in my studio. Says. Uh, for Faithful, uh, for writing Faithful, which has now been played over two million times on American radio. I keep phoning my manager going, where's the money? Where's yes. the money? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was it was just a great experience. I mean, the recording of it was great. And then we did a video with um, um, Candice and Michael, who, who had done the uh, uh, AHA video, you know, Take yeah. On Me. And it was just a joy, you know, and, and hearing yourself on the radio, uh, in the states, I mean, we we finally, finally managed to, to well, not break the states, but you know, at least people know, knew who we were over there. Yeah. And here it is. Here's faithful. Go west. This is Daz on 80s Mint, and I'm here with Richard Drummy on our Go West special. It's the Go West jukebox. It's I don't have to put money in, do I? <laughs> uh, give us another number, will you, Richard? Three. Three. We close our eyes. Tell us a bit about that. Uh, we close our eyes, um, as far as I'm concerned, was started on... Uh, I lived in a, in a one-bedroom flat with a girl in... Uh, uh, Julie, her name was... It was to be rude it was her flat actually um and she had an old um piano that wasn't very in tune and i came up with the with the chords um f for the beginning of it. i mean which is we we do quite we do work that way um and we especially recently where where you know i'll just play something to i'll play like several things to pete and he'll go that one um but yeah uh, that that's not uh we did that um i took it round to then to I think he was still living with his mum at that point. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, we coloured it in, as it were. And, um, yeah, it, it got chosen. In fact, the record company, when we finally made the record, said, we think Call Me's the hit, um, which was deliberately written as a hit, to be honest with you. I had enough of it. Yeah. So I just went, oh, come on, let's give them what they want. Um, obviously, the, the finished the finished one is much more developed, but the, the original demo sounded like seven ice cream bands coming around the corner. So um, they said, we don't want to lose Call Me in, in, you know, in, in, in the, uh, uh, at the beginning. So you guys choose what you want to put out first. And so we, we thought We Close Our Eyes was a much better song than Call Me. Mm. Um, and so they let us do it. And then the other great piece of luck was that somebody at chrysalis um managed to get godly and cream to do the video yeah, which was yeah. just unbelievable i mean they just done every breath you take and god knows what else um so um yeah we finally you know this is what i say to people you sometimes ask me to go and talk to to, to uh people at uh, music colleges and i just say no because i'll tell them not to do music because there's no money in it anymore yeah. but if if you do ask what's the most important thing i think it's resilience i think it's like 80 percent resilience and and 20 percent talent i think there's a lot of talented people out there who got you know i mean we we clung on for 10 years you're 10 years trying to get a deal and we still didn't give up yeah. um and and yeah so uh 
uh, eventually we closed, our, our eyes came out and we couldn't believe it when it went into number five. This is 80s Mint with me, Daz, and we're here with Richard Drummy from Gore West. Um, we're listening to some of the fabulous hits of Gore West on the Gore West jukebox. I'm asking Richard to pick us another number. I'll go for 10. Go for 10 from Baltimore to Paris. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's on the, the Dancing on the Couch album. <laughs> yes. um, the ill fated Dancing on the Couch album. I mean, it's about Edwards and Mrs. Simpson. We, we, we were kind of. It's it's a bit weird when you're in a duo. I shouldn't really be 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 getting letting people behind the curtain here, but <laughs> it is difficult. Like for instance, Goodbye Girl. I started that, and it and it was about actually the girl that I was living with that I just told you about because yeah. we kept splitting up and getting back together. But as soon as you then get Pete involved, he he'll come up with a lyric, and I'll go, no, that's not what happened, you know. Yeah. So it's not like we're Bob Dylan, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so on that occasion, I I think. I think we were, we, it might even have been from a sort of Sunday supplement or something, and 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 one of us noticed, um, you know, read the story about it with Mrs. Simpson, and we thought, well, that'd be a nice, that's a love story. Um, and uh, so yeah, so it was about Edward and Mrs. Simpson because she was from Baltimore and she, uh, I think she died in Paris or she ended up in Paris. Um, and uh, yeah, we we just got such fantastic players to come along I'm a Pino Palladino on the bass yeah, if you ever listen to it again I mean I, yeah. I had to I had to listen to it again sorry had to I listened to it again the other day for for, for, a, for a work reason and I must phone Pino actually and just I'll send it to him because I'm, I'm sure he's not not heard it since he played on it yeah. it's just amazing his bass playing he's you know he's something else <laughs> Baltimore to Paris there on our 80s Mint special with Richard Drummy from Gore West. Uh, Richard, can you give us another number from the Gore West jukebox, please? That's number one. Number one is the king of wishful thinking. Tell hey, us a little bit about hey. that. Um, well, the king of uh, the king of wishful thinking um, was the first song. Uh, I'll keep this brief. We'd, second album didn't do so well. We, we, we had a scream up with a record company basically for seven years. It, it was kind of a standoff. They wanted us to do certain things and we said, nope. And, the, I, and eventually um, we kind of, they got me and myself and Peter writing with, with different people and split us up. But then when, when Peter and I got back together, we were in LA um, with a guy called Martin Page. And uh, yeah, we wrote The King of Wishful Thinking. Um, being the gobby one in the band, I phoned the record company and said, we've got a hit. Yeah. And they went, have you? Oh, okay, all right. Well, we'll, we'll be a judge of that. <laughs> and uh, Kate came down and she said, you have got a hit, yeah. And then the guy that signed us in the first place, Ron, He'd been out of our life for, for quite a long time, 10 years maybe, and and he he got involved. He was the executive producer on the Pretty Woman film. And, uh, you know, luckily for us, it got into that. And uh, I, I haven't looked lately, but I think that album, last time I looked at it, it sold 12 million. Wow. So, um, you know, um, I, I, and it was a good film to be involved with. Um, I didn't want to do it because, well, A, when Ron first told us about it, he said, I said, oh no, don't get us involved in a film. I know what's going to happen. We're going to go round the country for, for for six months promoting a film. Yeah. I said, what's it called? And he said, 8,000. I said, oh great. I said, a, a science fiction film. I'm not a massive science fiction fan, uh, apart from the alien and the, you know, the better mm. ones. Um, and, uh, and I said, and who's in it? 
and he said Richard Gere. I said, "Is he still alive?" <laughs> and and, uh, and and I said, "And who's the who's the uh, who else?" He said, "Julia Roberts." I said, "No, nope, I haven't. I've never heard of her." I said, "Please don't make <laughs> us do this, Ron." I said, "You know, let, let, just let let us get on with the album." Um, and that's right. I said when I said it's a science fiction film, he said, "No, no, 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 no. It's a it, it's a romantic comedy, Richard." And I said, I said. I said, well, uh, why is it called 8,000? He said, well, it's about a guy that, you know, I'll, I'll drop the cod American accent. It's about a guy who, who hires a, a, um, a prostitute for the week for $8,000. I said, and, and that's a romantic comedy, is it? I said, that's not going to fly. Uh, but of course, I got wrestled to the ground, gaffer tape to put in the filing cabinet and, and we did it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. It's just, you know, one of the best afternoon or one of the best days work. We, we, writing-wise that we ever did. This is 80s Mint with me, Daz. It's the Go West special with our very special guest, Richard Drummy. Richard, we're playing the Go West jukebox. Can I have another number from the jukebox for me, please? Number four. Please. Number, number four, four is Call Me. Wow. Okay, well, Call Me. Um, we'd written the whole al- uh, the whole first album, and we'd shopped it around. Even we closed our eyes. A uh, different version, like the demo version, mm. and we chopped it around, and we'd got uh, knocked back by everybody um, to the point where it was almost pointless going back round again, yeah. because they'll just go. You know, I remember getting called into London by um, Mr. Ambrose. I think he signed Pink Floyd. Oh. I can't remember his first name, Dave, I think. And uh, he got us up there, and, and and he liked what he'd heard, and uh, so we took to he, we we went up there, and we thought, oh, this is it, this is it. And he said, I just wanted to let you know, I've been listening to your stuff again and uh, i really like it and i can't wait to hear what you do next and i was like if we come in in town for that um and i got a bit i got a bit annoyed um not with dave ambrose but 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 i just said let's just give the give them what they want i know what they want they they want a you know a very very poppy song Mm -hmm. so myself and peter started call me and uh you know if you heard the demo i mean it was very sugary and very kind of you know um, uh, it was only later that you know when Gary Stevenson got involved and we we put all the production things on and it sounded a lot more more aggressive and uh, yeah the record company thought it was, straight away as soon as they heard that they went yeah yeah we'll sign you we'll sign you that's it that's a hit um, and uh, they didn't want to get it get it lost in the wash as the first single so they let us choose and we said we close our eyes and then uh, they put uh, call me out put put call me out second and. Mm. That again, we got lucky with the with. Uh, we're not lucky; just the record company were good. I mean, they they said um, uh, this is going to be a very long answer, but um, they said, uh, "Do you know a guy called Russell Mulcahy?" And we went, "Yeah, the guy that does all the Duran Duran videos, and I'm still standing and whatever else." Mm. And uh, and uh, they said, "Yeah." So why? And they said, "Well." He, he quite likes, you know, what he's heard of you. He, he, he might, you know, he, he's up for doing a video. And we went, no way, fantastic. And at the time we'd seen a film, uh, Peter, and my, Peter and I's favourite film was a film called Rumblefish, which I think was Francis Ford Coppola and it had Mickey Rourke and, uh, um, oh, I can't remember his name, anyway, the other guy that's in it. And, um, and uh, yeah, so we went, we had a meeting with Russell and we sat down, he sat down, he went, all right, guys, because he's Australian. And uh, we said, yeah, yeah, great. Nice to meet you, mate. Anyway, um, what, what, what's the plan? And he said, have you ever seen a film called Rumblefish? And I said, you're not suggesting we do a film, we do a video based on Rumblefish, are you? And he went, yes, exactly what I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm proposing. And we went, yeah, we're in, we're in. And uh, it was amazing. I mean, it cost a fortune. I mean, yeah. it cost like 125 grand, which was like twice as much then. It's just back in that excessive 80s. Yeah period um and when we turned up for the to do the video we walked into this uh this big warehouse and there was this street you know like built like like you would see at universal yeah. and we went wow wow this looks great um where's our set and they <laughs> said no this is for you i said you've built this for one day for us 
Um, so it was fantastic. Wow. And we had, you know, Arlene Phillips. They, <laughs> see how the funny bit this is. They had something like, I don't know, was it 10 dancers or whatever? A bit like um, Thriller, you know. Yeah. And they, I was supposed to be the leader of that gang, as it were. Um, and so stood at the front and then Arlene said to me right well this is what you got to do and she showed me all these dance moves that all these guys had learned I said I can't do that Arlene she said she said no come on you can't I said no honestly I can tell you I won't be able to do any of that I'll just look a complete you know wazzic and uh she said well what can you do so I sort of did a thing where I did a Michael Jackson kind of um uh, turn and then folded my arms so all these dancers had to learn what i was doing <laughs> so uh yeah it was great and um yeah we've, we've had some fun with stuff like that i mean we've been very lucky uh with with the people that have come come across our path yeah <laughs> Richard Drummy is with us for the Go West 80s Mint special, and we're playing the Go West Jukebox. Richard, have you got another number for us? Seven. Seven. Good choice. I want to hear it from you. Oh, wow. Um, well, I want to hear it from you was the first single from the second album. Mm. Um, I don't remember a great deal about it. Um, again, the video was done by Godly and Cream, and, and if you ever watch it, my brother's in it. Um, but in it because it's uh, it's like a crowd scene. Um, but but he he looks very much like me, my brother. So if anyone's got it and they've got a day free, um, so yeah, I don't remember much. But one thing I did remember though was the riff is quite hard to play, um, and. I, I wasn't doing it, Alan was doing it, mm. Alan Murphy, I'm unfortunately no longer, you know, with us or, or you know, passed away a long time ago. Um, but um, he cut his finger halfway through the recording and he couldn't play. So everyone looked at me and I went, I don't know if I can play that, really. it's really <laughs> difficult. But uh, yeah, I managed to, I don't know, maybe well, maybe when I was out of the studio, they just cut the tape, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and copied it. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it didn't do particularly well. Uh, I mean, nothing on the second album did particularly well, to be honest with you. We didn't have a hit. I mean, we had top 40s and what have you off of it, um, but, uh, or top 25 or something. But it what was, you know, polar opposite to the first album, which, which, which just flew out, you know. <laughs> I want to hear it from you on our Go West Jukebox. This is the Go West 80s Mint special. I'm joined by Richard Drummy, a uh, very special guest. Richard, can you give us another number from the Jukebox, please? I will take number nine, Brilliant. please. Brilliant. The fabulous Goodbye Girl. Oh, um, well, Goodbye Girl um, was, was again, I, 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 I was living with, uh, with a girl called Julie in uh, West Drayton in this one-bedroom flat. She had an old piano there. Um, which was out of tune, but while she was out at work and I was, <laughs> I, I, I would bash around on it. I mean, the neighbours must have hated me because it wasn't like it was a detached house or something. Um, and uh, it was about me and her uh, at the beginning um, because we kept, you know, I kept moving out, moving back in, moving out, moving back in. Mm. So that was the idea of, uh, you know, goodbye girl. It's a game we we play every time we say goodbye girl. So. But uh, but as with all things, I mean, there's no point in writing a whole song and then taking it to peak because you'll go, well, you've written it. What am I going to do? Yeah. So, you know, I just started, you know, uh, the chords and then, you know, zotted over to Pete's, played in the chords and, and said, you know, I, I, I don't know who came up with the title. I can't remember. But uh, yeah, and, and I, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. I thought that after we'd had because um, I thought it was the best song on the, or, 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 or the biggest hit really on the first mm. album um, after we'd had a top five and then Call Me was, I don't know, near top ten or something 
and uh, no, it, it, it didn't fly for some reason. I don't know why. Um, I, I think we weren't around to promote it. We were because we were busy going all around the world. But yeah. I, I really, honestly, I'm a bit, you know, a bit conceited, to it, I suppose. But I thought it was going to be our biggest hit, but it wasn't. But I still love the song. Um, it's a great song. It should have a hi hat on it for those musicians out there <laughs> who know it. That was the problem. It it didn't have a hi hat, so it just went boof, <laughs> boof, <laughs> boof, you know. So um, yeah, perhaps we should have remixed it. But anyway, um, yeah, that's that's goodbye, girl. And and, and it's been quite nice because. A couple of times, Julie, I'm still in contact with her, and she's come along, and I always embarrass the hell out of her when I introduce <laughs> that song. Uh, here it is. Goodbye, girl. Especially for Julie. Take These Mints and the Go West special and I'm here with a very special guest Richard Drummy from Go West uh, we've been playing through some of the uh, the old classic Go West hits on our Go West jukebox uh, give us another number from the jukebox would you Richard please but excuse my language but number two <laughs> you'd like a number two um, I'd ev- like a number two please ev- every time, every time, it's still funny um, <laughs> number two is Don't Look Down Ah, don't look down. Well, don't look down was the fourth single off of the um, off of the first album, yeah. um, and it, we couldn't believe it. I mean, goodbye, girl, done okay, but 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 the other two, are, you know, uh, we closed eyes and called me done really well, uh, and we we promoted it, and it, and it was just flying up the charts. I yeah. mean, it was back in the day. It's not like these days where everybody sort of preloads and gets all their fans to buy. Um, or, for, or people who like the band, I hate the word fans, um, to, to buy it by the record on the same day. And most things now fly in at number one. They stick around for a week and then they fly out again. But back then, things used to come in at 102 and then go up to 65 and then 42 and etc. Um, and it just flew up the charts. And, I, I, and it got to, it kind of came in at 60, went to 30, went to 16. And then I, I thought, blimey it's christmas because it was yeah. i mean you know this could be in the top 10 for christmas if, if not better and we went away we, we we said do you need us to do anything else and they said no no it's fine this thing's got its own legs yeah now peter went to australia uh, and i went to new zealand so that will give you a rough idea of us trying to get away from being in the band <laughs> um and um and it went up to number 11 and then the week of christmas I thought, oh, this is definitely going to, you know, here we go, top 10 for Christmas, you know. And uh, it stayed at number 11. And I phoned up and I said, why have you let us go on holiday? And we should have been there. We could have, you know, we could have pumped air in the tyres. And they said, do you you want to know how many albums you've sold this week? And that's what had happened. I think people heard it and went, well, hang on, I like, I've got to get my girlfriend a Christmas present or my mum or or my dad or whatever, I don't know. And uh, so, so... People went, well, I like, we closed, I was like, call me, goodbye, girls, all right. And they, they just bought the album. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's how the album end up, ended up selling nearly, uh, I don't know if it's done it by now, but near two million or something like that, yeah. which was... Uh, which was just unbelievable for Cut the Chances from Twickenham. <laughs> and here it is, Don't Look Down by Go West.
This is 80s Mint with me, Daz. Richard, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us about your career uh, and the hits and for playing the Go West jukebox. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Absolute pleasure, Daz. I re- really, I've, I, I, I've been calling you Darren the whole time and yeah. you've been calling yourself Daz and I thought, <laughs> I've been with you long enough now. I can <laughs> I can get over familiar and call you Daz. So, <laughs> no, I've had a really good time. I, I, You know, I love talking about myself and Peter. <laughs> Fabulous. And we're going to leave you with the tracks of my tears from Go West. This has been the 80s Mint Go West special. We'll see you next time on 80s Mint.